Turn it up, swashbucklers. You're listening to Under the Crossbones, episode number 15. My name is Phil Johnson. I will be your host for the show. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, you can get all the show notes for the show at underthecrossbones.com slash 015. And that's the that's the general formula right there uh, to get to any of the show notes. For any of the shows, it's underthecrossbones.com slash zero, whatever the episode number is. Did you like the canon at the beginning? I added a canon to the theme song today just for the heck of it. Now, I hope it didn't. I hope it didn't scare. You. I hope you're not. If you're listening to this in the car, you're, I hope you weren't like, ah, oh, I have a flat tire, um, because I've I've had that happen in other podcast themes and things like that that I listen to where it's like freaks me out. Or like when you're listening to a song and there's like a police siren in the song and you're driving and you're all thinking you're getting pulled over and then it was just Public Enemy uh, with the siren in their song. So anyway, I hope the cannon didn't scare you. If it did, let me know. I'll take it out. I'm not married to it. It's okay. Uh, thank you on the show today. Uh, got a great guest for you. His name, his name is Tiger Lee. Now, anybody named Tiger Lee has to be an interesting person, right? You can't be like Tiger Lee, the accountant, Tiger Lee, the actuary. It's like that's a that's a cool name. You're going to have a cool thing, right? Tiger, he is the owner and proprietor of PirateFashions.com, which is a website, and it's also a brick-and-mortar store in Tampa, Florida. And uh, he didn't start out in the pirate thing. He didn't start out making pirate clothes. We're going to talk about how he got started as a photographer and then uh, moved all over the place uh, and finally settled in Florida and eventually transitioned from uh, uh, being a photographer into making uh, pirate clothes. He makes pirate clothes. They make pirate hats. They make pirate weaponry, uh, which you have seen in uh, Black Sails, Crossbones, Sleep. Be hollow, you know, all that kind of stuff. He supplies weapons to those uh, shows and movies and all that kind of stuff. So great conversation. I think you're really, really going to enjoy it. And uh, and we're going full pirate today. Full pirate. Uh, we're going to have some music today from Ye Banished Privateers, uh, who are a Swedish pirate band. Very cool. Uh, I think we're going to play a track from uh, their latest album. And I am going to have an interview with those guys coming up uh, in a few weeks. So uh, if you like the tune, be sure to watch for that interview. I got a, uh, we had a little bit of Skype trouble because uh, uh, we were talking from across the world. But I think I'm going to be able to make it work. Uh, but there will be an interview coming up with the Banished Privateer. So listen for that song. Comedy today from yours truly. Yeah, uh, I, I played you one of my songs a couple weeks ago, one of my regular nice little songs. But I've not played any of my uh, any of my comedy on the show yet, and I wanted to go full pirate today. But there's not a lot of comedians out there doing pirate material. Uh, Tim Bab, I played you some Tim Bab on episode number two, uh, and I'm the other one uh, that I know. I, I haven't found any other comics doing pirate material yet. And the material I'm going to play for you today is from my first comedy special, which came out in 2008. So it's pretty old. Frankly, it was a little painful listening back to it for me, but I think you're going to, I think you're going to enjoy it. Um, so, uh, and, and speaking of that, I will be on the road. I'm getting, I'm tying up a bunch of loose ends here at home so I can get back on the road this week. Um, Shows, you can find me at the uh, Russell City Bar and Grill in Hayward, California. That's this Wednesday, November the 11th. On November 13th and 14th, that's Friday, Saturday, I'm going to be at Goonies Comedy Club in Rochester, Minnesota. Uh, following that, I will be, uh, uh, let's see, November 18th through the 20th, I will be at Zany's Comedy Club in Rosemont, Illinois. That's just outside of Chicago. Beautiful club. Definitely come out and check that out if you're in the area. And then on November the 21st, I will be at the Sherman Bowling Center in Muskegon, Michigan. I'm headlining a bowling alley. Yeah. What's it to you? Yeah. No, it's, uh, it's, it'll be, yeah, it's in the bowling alley. I assume it's in their bar area. I'm probably not standing at the end of the lane with balls being hurled at me. Uh, but it should be a fun show and, uh, I'm doing a full hour at that one. So that'll be great. And then, uh, Saturday, November the 28th, I will be back here in California at the Englander in San Leandro and I'll be headlining that show as well. So, uh, you can find me at philjohnsoncomedy.com if you need details on any of those shows or whatever. You want to find some of my material and there it is. So, um, as uh, uh, something new on today's show, uh, yeah, besides the canon, the canon was, I thought, a nice touch. But like I said, if it scares you, let me know, because uh, I don't want to I don't want to freak you out while you're driving. Uh, that would be dangerous. Um, trying something new on the show today because uh, a few of you have emailed me and asked about uh, supporting the show uh, in some way, financially, monetarily, uh, with some dough, with some booty, with some ducats. And um so here's what I've got. I've got three things that you can that you can do. Uh, but I do put a lot of time into this show. I love doing this show. Uh, I spend at least eight to twelve hours a week working on this show each episode, and uh, it's it's great. And I want to keep bringing these interviews to you. So a little bit of financial support would be fantastic. So if you go to underthecrossbones.com/support, 
That's hard to say, actually. Slash support. You will find a there's a PayPal donation box right there, and that is just straight up whatever amount you want to give. Just dump it in the box, hit it. You don't have to have a PayPal account. You can do it with a credit card through there. Same same deal. Whatever amount you want to give, that's super awesome. Uh, the second thing you can do is there is an Amazon banner there. And if you are a podcast listener at all, you know how this Amazon banner thing works. But if you don't, all you have to do is click that Amazon banner on that page. And then when you buy something from Amazon on that trip to Amazon, I get a little uh, commission. I get a little kickback. Um, and uh, and that's helpful as well. Um, so it's not forever. And it doesn't cost you uh, anything extra, of course. You just, you're just you just clicking the banner and shopping, buying your fancy hats and things uh, like normal. And then Amazon just sends me uh, some pennies and it's all good. Uh, and then the third thing on there is if you would like to be a sponsor of the show, um, I'm doing little, I will, I can do like a little 30 second uh, voicey commercial lead thing, you know. Uh, and here's the thing. This is still a small show. If you've ever felt like I'm talking directly to you, uh, it's because I'm talking directly to you right in your ear, right while you're driving. That's how it is. Because this is still, a, it's still a small show. I don't have a ton of listeners yet, but we're growing. We're getting bigger. And that is very, very exciting to me. We, the last last week, we had our biggest downloads, uh, download days of the week. Very, very cool. Um, but if you want to be a sponsor of the show right now, it is stupid cheap. Very, very cheap to get uh, a commercial for your business or service on this show. Um and I'm going to be picky and not, I'm not going to let just anybody advertise. I want it to be something that, that you're going to be interested in other then it's a win-win for everybody. So any, if any, you want to check out any of that, the donations, the Amazon banner, the sponsorships, opportunities, that whole thing under the crossbones.com slash support. All right. So, uh, I think I covered everything. We got the shows, we got the, the thing, we got the, the, uh, we got that. All right. And uh, here we go. You ready for the interview with Tiger Lee? Here it is, my interview with Tiger Lee from PirateFashions.com. Tell me about uh, what you are doing right now with Pirate Fashions. What's tell? Uh, let us tell us about the business. Well, we be in the grand high tide of Halloween, and it is quite busy for us as all these lovers want to be transformed into. Seafaring pirates. <laughs> All right, and so you are basically um, a, a shop that sells uh, pirate uh, clothing, uh, weapons, uh, accessories, that type of thing. Well, we are not just any shop; we are the shop. Because what makes us unique from all those imitators? If you go search, you know, pirate costumes out in the worldwide internet. Mm -hmm. You will find mostly uh, these little websites that are drop ship companies, which means when you place an order, it goes to a company who forwards it to a factory who, where the factory actually sends it directly to the customer. So those companies actually have zero inventory, and most of them have not even physically touched or handled the product at all. Mm -hmm. They can't answer any questions. They can't do anything. They just, you know, so their big thing is, uh, you know, because they don't have it, they have zero overhead, meaning they can charge less for something they don't know about. And, you know, all they've done is build a website. Right, <laughs> right. And so what makes, okay, uh, so, what makes you guys different? Well, what makes us different is that we our actual brick and mortar store uh, is a 4,000 square foot store and we have the widest selection of stuff. Um, and the, how we can have the widest selection of stuff is that, yes, we buy lots of our stuff from other places, but we also actually manufacture stuff ourselves. Mm. So, you know, we make everything from uh, pirate knee breeches to pirate frock coats in-house. We make custom uh, pirate tricorns from wool felt, and we're, we steam it and cock it and shape it. We, have a, we do our own leather, uh, like baldrics and holsters and scabbards. And we actually make our own black powder weapons right here in the store. Functional ones, then. And these aren't just any black powder weapons. 
Um, you know, because most people, when they make black powder weapons, they order all these parts and they assemble it, and, you know, then they say they, they're, they've made the weapon. Mm-hmm. You know, so, I mean, where we actually... Um, we actually design weapons, and we can produce them from scratch, or we can actually work with other companies to produce some parts, and then we make them, we test them, uh, meaning we proof the barrels, and we warranty them for life. And, and so because of that, you know, we're, we, we also have the widest range from wheel locks to match locks, to flint locks, to Michelet locks, to Spanish locks, to um, English locks, in a much wider range than anyone in the entire world makes. That's really cool. How did you get into, um, or how, how did you learn and how did you get into creating real firearms like that and, and period pieces and even the clothing and things? Well, I mean... Um, in terms of the black powder weapons, is uh, it's my partner, okay. uh, uh, Mad Mike. He is my gun maker, and he's there's only three people in the world that can build a wheel lock from scratch, and he is one of them. Wow. Um, you know, he spent much time in the military and uh, has been making guns for for more than two or three decades. Mm, okay. Um, you know, so that's one of, you know, that's how we got into that. But, you know, originally I was a photographer. Okay. And I had just failed in uh, a photography studio in uh, San Diego uh-huh. when one of my best friends, uh, Ted Shred, who owns a company called pirates for hire and said, Hey, you should come with me and shoot pirates. <laughs> and, uh, and what he meant was, is that, you know, he, he, uh, get, gets, um, jobs to portray pirates at parties and at conventions. And he got tasked to do a convention, uh, that was pirate themed. And they actually wanted a photo, of pirate booth. Okay. And, you know, and I was a photographer, and he said, oh, well, you should do this. And I said, well, you know, you're down on your luck. Uh, piracy looks good, a quick way to make a buck. So I decided <laughs> I'd try it up. And, and uh, of course, I made no money on that first deal because I had to spend it all getting pirate outfits. Okay. So then for, us, for me to make any money, I had to continue on the account and plunder more so I can actually make enough to at least pay for what I invested in the costuming. But then, you know, once you have it going, then the only way you can make money is you continue on that slippery slope of piracy. <laughs> and that's, that seems like a very authentic way to get into the business you're in. That's fantastic. Yeah, so, uh, so it wasn't like I was a kid saying, hey, I want to be a pirate when I grow up. Uh-huh. That wasn't it. You know, which most pirates aren't that way. They just happen to fall into it because of certain circumstances. And, and uh, many of my crew members here that I've employed, as you know, they're down on their luck and, you know, they want a fun, adventurous job and, and you know. And piracy is it. That's <laughs> and yep. I, I imagine taking photos of pirates was a lot more interesting than weddings and little kids and whatever you were taking pictures of previously. Oh, well, no, my, my previous job was I was trying to do fantasy portraits, mostly um, fairies and angels. Oh, okay. I, I've never been the normal conventional type. Yeah. <laughs> I can tell that already, and that's wonderful because uh, so nobody listening to this show is the normal conventional type either, so that's really fantastic. So then how long did you do the uh, the photography part of that for? Well, I did that for maybe three years or, well, actually longer than that. Well, I I was doing it for three years in San Diego during up and down the coast of the Pacific. Okay. And it was about 2007 I saw that the economy was starting to tank and that I would need to move to a place that had more business where I would transfer 
transition from, you know, going from festival to festival to a permanent location, you know, where I can make less money per day but work more days and be able to survive the uh, the slowing economy. Uh-huh. So I looked all over and decided St. Thomas, the Virgin Islands, would be the best place for me to move to. Interesting choice. And why, why did you pick that? Uh, because it's the number two cruise ship destination in the world. Oh, okay. But, it, uh, but in terms of once you get there, they, they had the highest spending per person, like at $197. Okay. Versus Cosmel, Mexico, which is the number one tourist destination from a cruise ship, but they only would make like eighty-seven dollars. I see. Okay. So, 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 it, it, so uh, you know, eight months later, I packed up, I moved out, I drove to Florida, a uh, plane to the Virgin Islands, scouted the island for two weeks, and moved some of my stuff there, and figured out, nope. This is not the place. <laughs> All those cruise ship people are old fogies who don't pay to get their picture taken. Uh-huh. And the mosquitoes were horrible and the natives were worse. <laughs> so I decided that, you know, half my stuff was in Florida. If I jumped back real quick, I could do three festivals in Florida and maybe have enough money to drive back to San Diego if all was worse. Okay. But in that three weeks, I, I searched around all the towns in the area, Key West to Miami to Orlando to St. Augustine to Charleston and Savannah. Uh-huh. So I looked at all those places and decided St. Augustine was it. Okay. Even though I had reservations because, you know, I was an old-time photo booth that only did pirates, and there were three other old-time photo studios within two blocks oh, okay. of, of each other. And the, the one that had been there the least amount of time was eight years, and the longest was 30. So they were all good, strong competitors against, you know. Yeah, and how were you able to differentiate yourself? Well, because my photos are better. All right. <laughs> and I specialized in pirates, and amazing as it may seem, they did not. Oh, okay. They were their biggest thing was still cowboys. Oh, okay. which is almost all the staple of every old time photo studio in the entire U.S. is usually about seventy percent cowboys. I see, and I thought it might be that way because certainly all the ones I see here on the West Coast that's their that's their main game is the Western motif. But I thought maybe it might have been different. Well, there. yes, but that makes sense because in the West there are cowboys. Sure, yeah. But in Florida, well, there were some cowboys, but. People don't think Florida cowboys. They Not think usually. <laughs> pirates. <laughs> right. right. So, you know, you, so being in the area, you know, old time folio studio works well with its history. Like you go to Chicago, you get the old time gangsters. Right. right? Uh huh. But, you know, when you go to Florida, you should get pirates, but you don't. Right. So I was able to survive off the pirates, but I wasn't, you know, which meant that. What everybody does in the old-time photo world is they widen their market by offering, oh, we do pirates, we do gangsters, we do cowboys, we do civil war, Mm. you know. Uh And that's how, you know, so between all those genres, then you can get enough to do business. But I had no interest in doing all those other things. I only wanted to do pirates. Uh So what I did was... I said, okay, I will offer pirate products. Hmm. You know, I started out, you know, with some T-shirts and my calendar line, which I guess you should know about too. So when I first started photographing pirates, I decided uh, I would do a hot pirate babe calendar. (laughs) And, of course, I had never done a calendar. I didn't know you couldn't really do one in the way, you know, it's like, because normally you would have to have your calendar done like uh, at least nine months, close to a year before the beginning of the year. Sure. And I, uh-huh. didn't, I, I had uh, no outfits, no models, no money, no distribution, <laughs> nothing. And I started about 
June. Oh, right? wow. Yeah. <laughs> so then I had to find models, and I didn't have any money because I just failed a business. You know, being a pirate, and of course, we don't follow the rules of normal civilized society. So I decided, hey, I'm going to do a calendar. And, you know, um, but I was a fairly good photographer. So if you got a good portfolio, you can always get good models by showing them some very unique stuff. Uh-huh. And then I, you know, r- uh, I borrowed outfits from other places. But the big thing was how do you do it with no money and no distribution? Right. So I solved that problem by saying, hey, I'm going to put ads in the bottom and, you know, but you can't actually get money for ads because, you know, you don't have a track record. Sure. You know, yeah. So I found, you know, pirate businesses and I said, hey, buy an ad, get it on the bottom of each calendar and what you're going to get, you're going to get 100 calendars. Okay. So, so, so actually, and then you can sell those calendars. And then you'll actually make way more money, you know, because you'll get it, you know, for like $2 or a dollar each, you know. So then when I did that, then I had my half, more than half of my distribution was through all the sponsors. Oh, I see. Two birds with one stone. So That's the, great. the money of the sponsorship paid for the print run. Uh-huh. And solve, you know, part of the uh, distribution issue. Oh, interesting. So that was a cool way to do it, and that's how I got started. And, you know, I I became infamous in the pirate world because of my <laughs> calendar series. Okay. And right. are, you, are you still doing those calendars? Nope. I have not done one in three years. I But one of the things from that calendar series, I decided to build a logo, and it, it was a, a female pirate symbol we call the molly rogers which Uh ended up being a a shirt line oh that's great one thing leads to another and then so what did you do i mean so when i started that shop you know the things i had were the molly t-shirts and the calendar and my photography Uh but then slowly i i started adding you know some regular pirate clothing like shirts and and then i got into making hats and and then i got into making leather stuff. So all the, you know, and then I looked for a uh, seamstress and, you know, we started making pirate clothes. And, uh, you know, but my first store in St. Augustine, the store was 280 square feet, about Much the size of a bedroom. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, so very small. And it was like $1,800 a month for rent. Uh-huh. So it was super expensive you know, very small. But, you know, I survived my first 18 months there. Then I moved to uh, a 1,400 square foot store. And then later I had to get another building across the street to put the production facilities because we're growing. Mm-hmm. You know, and then after a while, the, I lost the lease and they wouldn't give me another one. So I, and I couldn't find a location that suited so I ended up um, moving from uh, St. Augustine to Tampa. Oh, okay. And then when I when I did that, I actually, you know, it first started that I was like 90% photography and 10% spirit products. And by the time, you know, I was leaving, you know, photos was like 20% and clothing was 80 And when I moved here, I decided I'm not going to, well, originally I said, oh, I'm going to wait to set up the studio. But after, you know, six months, I had only had two requests. So I said, I'm going to drop it. Oh, okay. Huh. Interesting. And so who do you have, um, who comes in to buy pirate stuff? I, I imagine around Halloween, you're plenty busy. And probably around uh, the Gasparilla Festival season, you're pretty busy. But in the rest of the year, who comes in and buys pirate clothes? Well, I mean, yes. The, the September and October... September because of Talk Like a Pirate Day, uh-huh. and October because of Halloween, and January because of, um, of Gasparilla are my three main months where I probably make half of my income. Oh, I see. Okay. But I mean, 40% of my money comes from online, 
50 actually comes from the store, and 10 is when I do different festivals, uh, you know, pirate festivals throughout Florida and Virginia and Georgia. That's interesting. So the the, the website has been, it sounds like a big, now did, it, did you start with the website or did you start with a brick and mortar place? Uh, let's see, before I had a physical store, I did have the Hot Pirate Babe calendar mm-hmm. site. Oh, I, so okay. So I was right. doing some sales of my calendars, and then I had a second site called the Molly Rogers, which sold the T-shirts. So I actually had two small websites that just were very specialized in the products. Oh, I see. Okay. So when I moved and set up my own store, you know, I actually it was it was probably almost a year before I actually started to, to build a site, a website for my store. Mm, well, no, okay. actually I did, but, but it was all advertising device about um, the photos. Okay. Because it was an old-time photo studio. It wasn't like it is now where it's all these hundreds of different products. Uh-huh. But, you know, slowly it started, I started adding the pirate products, and that part got bigger and bigger. Okay, interesting. How did you find the people that? Um, how, how did you find the people that you work with that, to do the manufacturing? And I know you do some of the manufacturing in house and some of it out, out outside of the business. How were? How did you run across people that knew how to make that stuff? Well, actually, I mean, like, um, say the well, the the leather stuff. I just you know, I just figured out. It's like, well, you, you know. You go to a store and you buy leather and say, how do you do this? And they explain. <laughs> they say, buy these books, look at these videos. And, okay. You know, you, and then I figured that out. So then after I figured it out, I just trained someone else to do it. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, uh, in terms of the clothing, well, actually, uh, before I did clothing, I started doing hats. And actually, you know, because um, St. Augustine is the oldest city in the United States. It's 450 years old. Uh-huh. So there are a lot of like reenactors that lived there. Mm. And I had, you know, and they'd come into my store and then they asked me about hats. And one guy said, well, I could show you how to steam a hat and do a tricorn. So he taught me and then, you know, and I went off from there. You know, when I was looking for a seamstress, you know, I hired, you know, I, you know, I first had somebody just you know, to, uh, you know, I say I'm looking for some pirate stuff, and they made me stuff, but it was wasn't my design, it wasn't that good, uh-huh. and so I decided I wanted to do it in house. So I actually looked to hire a seamstress, you know, and right. you know, on the ads, it's like, oh well, be good if you've done costumes or historical stuff, and I found well, one seamstress who was big in the cosplay and, and was mm. primarily just doing costumes. And, you know, uh, and so I brought her in and, you know, and I, sh- I bought some historical patterns and we went over those and modified them and, and we went from there. You know, we started with one item and, you know, grew into multiple items. And, you know, and, and I, we have really done a lot of research, you know, lots of stuff that is out there most of it is not historical at all. It's sure. totally fantasy made up stuff. People don't know like oh like if you're portraying a golden age pirate that, you know, the pirate coats didn't actually have collars or lapels. But no. you know, almost all the pirate coats I see people are wearing and buying have collars and lapels. Oh, interesting. I mean that was something eighty a hundred years later, but it wasn't during the golden age. Oh, interesting. Do you have any favorite um, resources that you discovered along the way for learning about stuff like that? Well, yeah, there's lots of them all over the place, little bits here and there. Uh Um, But, you know, those are sort of my secrets. But, you know, I mean, if you, you know, uh, you know, if you're seriously, you know, looking for some stuff, you know, like a piracy pub forum is a pretty good one. Okay. Um, but there's a whole difference between, and, and I'm working on a project now uh, where I'm getting ready to do a, 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 a blog article series about dressing like a pirate because there's, there's no book 
that has ever been written about how to dress like a pirate. Uh-huh. Not a single one out of thousands of pirate books. Uh-huh. That subject has not been breached. Interesting. And, you know, very rarely can you go out, you know, because there are millions of books out there to find a subject that has that is sort of popular and there's nothing on it. Yeah, that's the holy grail of publishing right there. Right. But there's a reason why, because it's there's a reason why there aren't any books, because there's a very little documentation. Okay. You know, that's... and if you get into trying to be historical, then it's like you have no documentation. Hmm. You know, it's like pirates uh, didn't have their pictures taken. Right. <laughs> there are there are there are a few, um, you know, woodblock kind of images of pirates, but most of those are where a newspaper trying to sell newspapers hires an artist, and the artist draws a picture of a pirate that he hasn't seen. Mm -hmm. Right? And then that picture gets reproduced numerous times, and each time it gets reproduced, uh, you know, it gets modified. Because there are some where you can see, oh, this is the same picture, and this is the same picture 10 years later and it's changed and then there's another one 10 years later but you know so it might have been changed five times and then when we see it oh this picture is 150 years old it must be real <laughs> right <laughs> but but it's not so i mean uh and you know if you look into the writings and uh court documents and and things you know most of the time when they write about pirates they're talking about what the pirate did, uh-huh. not what he looked like. Right, that's interesting. And I, I would think that you, I mean, you could, you could, as a starting place, just go say, look at what it, what was London fashion like at the time, or something like that. But I'm, since they were traveling so much, I imagine that they both picked up uh, clothing ideas from all the different variety of places they were visiting, but also whatever they well, happen to be able to steal as well. Well, yes and no. Okay, so how you figure it out is. Generally, pirates would wear generally what they what other people of that time and place wore. Uh huh. Okay. Then you could get a little more specific and go to, and they probably wore very similar stuff to what sailors of that time and place wore. Uh huh. Okay. And then, in terms of that whole thing about, oh well, they travel and stole from everybody, so they wore clothes of everybody. Not true. Oh, interesting. Okay. Just, well, it is a little bit true, uh-huh. but all the sailors I met who have went to Japan don't like dress like Japanese, <laughs> okay. nor do they dress like Muslims. That makes sense. So it's just like it is now, it is back then. So yes, occasionally you get a little bit of flavor here and there, and the occasional goofy person does do that. But by and large, the clothing you grew up in is the clothing you still are in. Oh, okay. That makes that makes total sense. So that would okay. uh, that would at least give you a place to start tracking down the the looks and fashions. So even though they could have had all kinds of cool clothes from all different places, they would probably just sell it and not wear it. I see. Okay. I mean, if it was very distinctly different. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, that I mean, definitely they might have said, "Oh, well, I like this hat. I'm going to keep this hat." But the rest of the stuff it just doesn't feel right when I wear it. I see. Okay. Yeah, that makes total sense. Which now. is exactly what people do now. Because when we make, when we take historical patterns and uh-huh. we make clothes from it and we put it on people, they go, this doesn't feel right. I'm not <laughs> buying it. They can't tell you why. Well, it's because back then the, the breeches and pants were worn high waisted. Right now, we wore them very low on the hip. Uh huh. So the you know the shirts were built a different way, and we built some, and we put them on, and they go, oh wow, this is I know why they don't make shirts like this anymore. <laughs> you know, so there's there's lots of little things that we you know plus you know the sizes were different and the proportions how the bodies are is different. So we have to change. Lots of little things for you to actually make something sellable to the general public. 
I see. Okay. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Now, a lot of your stuff, you've uh, supplied clothing and, and props and stuff to mo- some movies and TV shows, if I read correctly, right? Aye, that we have. <laughs> Last year, we did um, supply stuff uh, to uh, Black Sails, Sleepy Hollow, Turn, and Crossbones. Ah, interesting. Uh, most of that were in the weapons section Oh, uh, because... Hollywood has these very strong guilds. Uh-huh. So the Customers Guild of Hollywood really wants to keep hold of all the stuff they can, and they muscle the studios into only buying from them. Mm-hmm. But since there are no black powder gun factories in California, because <laughs> they're sort of anti-gun, right. um, uh, there's not a powerful guild there to mess with us in the gun world. Oh, I see. Okay. Interesting. I do miss Crossbones. I enjoyed that show. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so uh, like, uh, you know, in the first scene of Crossbones, yeah. where uh, he he shoots the, I forget that gizmo, uh, the chronometer. Oh, right, yeah. So the blunderbuss they used to shoot that with is ours. Oh, fantastic. Well, now i got to go back and watch it again. We actually, my, my previous podcast was all about that particular show, so I uh, I probably have that in my notes somewhere. <laughs> but that's really cool. And, uh, and uh, yeah, and uh, Black Sails, also a great show. That one's been really fun. I haven't had a chance to watch Turn yet, but it's on the DVR. So I'll be, I'll be watching for your stuff. Well, uh, Tiger, this has been super fun. I'm glad we finally got a chance to talk. Is there, is there anything I didn't bring up yet that you want to let us know about? Oh, well, 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 I mean, you know, so I mean, uh, I think I was only halfway talking about, oh, the different, so I'm writing this uh, blog article series oh, yeah. about dressing like a pirate, and one of the first articles is about um, the different types of pirate outfits. So one of them, you know, so I, I'm divided that world into six segments, okay. where we have um, Halloween costume pirate, which, you know, is polyester and cheap and looks like everything else and falls apart. Uh-huh. <laughs> and then, then the next grade up is the thrift store pirate, you know, where you can take just common things in your household and with a scissors instantly transform it into pirate. Okay. Not really, just, you know, they just um, cut yeah. the edges and make it raggedy and, you know, Unless you've just fallen off the ship, and you know your pirates weren't that way. Right. Uh, then, then the next one we have is uh, parade pirate. You know, so Mardi Gras, Gasparilla. They're very colorful. They have big skulls and crossbones emblazed on different parts, and you know, I mean, which is something that pirates didn't do. They didn't put skulls and crossbones on them to say, I'm a pirate, you right. hang me, you know, but <laughs> people think that, that, you know, everything they buy should have a skull and crossbones to say that they're a pirate, but right. it really wasn't that way. Then next would be Hollywood. And so Hollywood gets a lot of things right, but they get a, a lot of some things wrong in terms that for the, for an uneducated person, they would look and say, that looks really good and real. I, I think that's what a pirate would look like because all that clothes is old. But uh-huh. what happens many times is, you know, like um, the golden age of pirates, 1680s, uh, 1720s, right? Uh-huh. Right. So if you look at Pirates of the Caribbean, almost all the clothes they wear is about 1750s to 1780s. So mm. they're, you know, 50 to 70 years Late, yeah, you know, and then say in Black Sails, uh, Captain Flynn wears a short uh, west kit, a short vest, which is sort of popular in the maybe 1800s. Then oh. he wears a long frock coat of the 1710s, and you know, and he carries guns from 1760, and <laughs> you know, so they they mix, you know, time error stuff together in one outfit, which, right. you know, wouldn't be quite correct. It'd be, you know, so, so that's the thing with the Hollywood one. And then we have one called 
real pirates. So this is the classification where I try to make my stuff for. And it's what, with some education and uh, what we think pirates should wear, like uh-huh. tricorn hats and bandanas and sashes and boots, uh-huh. right? And long frock coats. Right. Okay? That's the traditional image we get through because of Hollywood and movies and plays and all that. And then there's the next and last category is authentic, what pirates really wore, uh-huh. you know? And, and that's all somewhat debatable, and that's a hard, slippery one to do. But, you know, there, there are is sayings that, you know, pirates didn't wear boots. They wore buckle shoes. Boots was made for cavalry. Oh, Warm interesting. To protect your legs from chafing on a horse. Uh-huh. There's no need for that on a boat. Makes sense. You know, and, and the whole sash and banana thing is like, uh, well, you look at all the pictures, the sailors, they wore neckerchiefs. They didn't wear bandanas. Mm. You know, there's lots of little debatable things, you know, so, the, and, you know, and most sailors wore short clothes, not long clothes, not the long frock coats and waistcoats and whatever, uh-huh. you know. And then, you know, they're, they, 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 they wore plaid. They wore striped, thin pinstriped stuff. They, there's lots of things in terms of fabric. And they didn't wear black. They probably wore <laughs> white mostly because you got all this old sail that you're going to throw away. Oh, and sure. And clothes out of it. It's white. It's not black. Right. You know, so, you know, I mean, but, you know, nowadays, uh, you know, 80% of what I sell is black, even though we <laughs> hate it, but... It's everybody wants black, you know, Uh so, so there, there's, you know, so, but the thing is, why does it, nobody wants to really dress up like a real pirate or (laughs) historically accurate pirate if no one recognizes you as being a pirate. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right. So, so the, so that's why I've made this, this, there's the real category and then there's the authentic. Uh Uh-huh. So the real is not really real. It's fake. Right. But it is what we think of as real. Interesting. I wonder, I, I imagine some of the Hollywood stuff is, is uh, one, because those uh, heads of wardrobe aren't super educated as to the, the, the period correct stuff, but also they're probably just looking at it from a visual standpoint. They go, well, I don't like the period gun that's correct. I like the one that looks better on him, you know? Well, well there's a lot of things. One is, one is availability that very few, <laughs> lots of people make stuff, for Rev War, 1776. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of research, you know, that, ta- that, that, that covers, you know, that time period very well, especially in America, uh-huh. you know, because of the Revolutionary War. Sure. But when, and actually, and then there's, uh, there, there's a good bit of documentation about English Civil War, 1650. Mm-hmm. But in between that time, there wasn't a, a major, huge war, and there's no that that whole 1700s period is very sparsely documented compared to earlier or later in time frame. Huh. Interesting. And you know, so and and in in terms of guns, flintlocks, the French lock, which is the traditional flintlock that most of us recognize didn't really come to be until almost at the very end of the Golden Age, like the 1720s. Uh-huh. So the earlier locks, like the dog lock and the English lock and the Michelet lock uh, and the snap-ins, which would have been more common, almost no one makes those weapons. Oh, That's why they can't get them. I see. They came to us. Right. You know, so, <laughs> you know, so that's one of the things... And, you know, and then, you know, the Errol Flynn thing, you know, back then, you know, all the sword fighting was with a foil, a Uh big, long, pointy stick, when, in fact, we know they were using short, stubby cutlasses. Right. right? Yeah. You know, so, I mean, you know, but the, the, the image of that, you know, became so strong, you know, lots of people think that pirates were, you know, like Peter Pan. (laughs) Use a foil. Right. Right? Um, so, yes, there's lots of little things, you know, that people think are real, but, you know, weren't really 
historically correct. Right, right. Well, I've certainly learned a lot, and uh, certainly uh, as soon as I can, uh, as soon as I'm down in Florida to do some shows, I am definitely going to stop by your place because uh, the pictures on your website look like it's a, a treasure trove of just stuff to geek out on. So, <laughs> oh yeah, and like on our website, one of the things we do is, you know. You know, we have all these videos on the, how to tie a sash and a bandana, things like that, which, you know, if you go to all my competitor sites, they don't have any of that. Right. You can't even find a picture of who they are, uh-huh. you know. So, I mean, that, you know, we're, I mean, we're trying to promote, a, you know, some education about, you know, what is real and what is not. And, you know, and, you know, I would suggest any of your readers to come look at our site and, and have a look at what we do produce, which, you know, you know, I mean, I'm not saying all of it we produce in house, but, you know, I mean, but most stores in America, they don't produce anything. Right. Yes. They just contract it out and they buy it from whoever's cheapest. Yeah. And you don't want the Um, cheesy polyester stuff because that just looks lame. (laughs) Yep. Most of the stuff in our store, we, we, we really try to have it, you know, of silk, linen, cotton, leather. Right, you know things that are natural, which also breathe better. The polyester, it, it doesn't breathe, even though it may be very thin, it do, it doesn't breathe as well as natural fibers. So you won't feel as comfortable in it. Right, that makes sense. That makes sense. Well, I uh, so the uh, the store itself is located in Tampa, Florida, and the website is piratefashions dot com, and I'll be making uh, I'll put a link to that on the show notes here. And, uh, yeah, this has been really great. I'm glad we finally got a chance to talk. All right. Cool. Well, we will talk soon then, and I'll let you know as soon as the show is up. All right. Well, may your horizons be filled with gold and treasures. I like it. Thank you, Tiger. I'll talk to you soon. And that's it, friends. That was my interview with Tiger Lee from PirateFashions.com. How interesting is that guy, right? He's moving all over. He's taking pictures. He's making pirate hats and and, and flintlock guns and just really cool. Uh, it's, I'm always... Uh, even, uh, I have high expectations of the people that I interview and I am always, they're always surpassed. It's always even a more fun interview than I expect it to be, which is very cool. All right, let's get to some comedy and some music. So like I said, today I'm going to play some comedy from yours truly. And, um, uh, because I wanted, I was looking for pirate bit and I'm the only one of two people I know who does any comedy about pirates. So, um, now warning like last week, and I didn't get any complaints last week about the comedy. So good, good for you. Good for you because you're adults. Uh, this uh, comedy bit has some language in it uh, and some adult themes. Uh, so, because uh, it's about pirates, come on. So, uh, if if you're if you have kids in the car or with you, or you want to tune in later and listen to that, or just uh, you know cover your ears or whatever, you can tune out for the next few minutes and uh, and and pick it up when the music comes back on. But this is uh, some comedy from uh, my first comedy special called "What Color Is Your Laugh." And, uh, like I said, it's from 2008. Um, it's not a bit I do anymore. And it was kind of painful going back and listening to my own material. Uh, cause I feel like I'm a better comedian now, but it, I wanted to play you some pirate stuff. So this is coming up. And then after that, we are going to have a song from ye banished privateers, a Swedish pirate band, uh, with their song called bring out the dead from their latest album, the legend of Libertalia. Like I said, I'm going to have an interview coming up with these guys. Uh, super cool. The album is great. Check it out at ye banished privateers.com. All right. Comedy music. Here we go. Let's do it. Uh, ever since I was a kid, I've been a big fan of pirates, right? Which is really like saying you're a big fan of serial killers. You know, <laughs> I mean, these guys were the hardcore, nasty thieves, criminals, con men of their time. Like you'd look over and go, Ooh, there's a pirate. Stay away from that guy. Like now, you'd look over and go, ooh, there's a Nigerian prince with financial troubles. Stay away from that guy. (laughs) But it's odd because we romanticize pirates so much now. They're toys and they're games and they're movies and they're rides, right? Rides. Like I think 100 years from now, Disneyland's going to have a ride called Gangbangers of the Compton. (laughs) It'll be fantastic. You walk down this dark alley and somebody shoves you at gunpoint into a Cadillac Escalade. That's just the ride vehicle. (laughs) <laughs> and then as it starts, you slowly drift by this restaurant, this really exclusive restaurant on the right called Bubba's Meat and Shit, <laughs> where you dine under the romantic glow of Argon streetlights and all the waiters are dressed like crackheads. <laughs> then they send you down this waterfall, right? Right at the bottom of the waterfall, you hear the, the first strains of the ride's theme song. Yo, ho, 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 give me my money, you bitch. <laughs> 
Dead hoes tell no tales. You know. <laughs> And they take you through a bunch of scenes, but the best part is at the end, there's this adorable little scene of three drug dealers in jail, and they're all trying to get the only key to the cell from the little pit bull who's busy chewing the guard's face off. <laughs> and they take your picture on the ride. You can buy your picture after, right, like they do now? And the picture is great. It's of you in the jail cell with one of the drug dealers behind you with his pants down, and you're... <laughs> That is the Christmas card picture that year, let me tell you. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they actually changed the Pirates of the Caribbean ride a few years ago. They decided to put trays of food into the women's hands so that the pirates were chasing the food, not the boot <laughs> Now, it doesn't seem to matter that in previous scenes they're auctioning prostitutes, burning down the town, drowning the mayor, shooting each other, drinking themselves silly, None of that could possibly influence our children in a bad way. But horny pirates... No, no. And we have something in this country called Talk Like a Pirate Day. You guys know about Talk Like a Pirate Day? Yeah, only the dorks do, okay. But we have Talk Like a Pirate Day where everybody gets to talk like a pirate for the day. A uh, pretty creative title, I think. So I figure 100 years from now, we're going to have Talk Like a Gangster Day, right? It'll be the one day when the teacher can walk up and go, Johnny, where's your homework? And then go, back the fuck up, bitch! You know what I've been doing is shit! <laughs> and she can go, oh, that's right, it's Talk Like a Gangster Day. Well, Johnny, best not fuck with this bitch. I'm going to shove my size now and your skinny little crack of ass, you feel me? <laughs> Yes, it will be the one day of the year when little kids can talk like gangsters. Not like now when it's every day. <laughs> but it's weird because we do romanticize these pirates so much. And I think it's only because they're not around anymore. If they were, totally different game. For instance, we wouldn't even call them pirates. We'd call them marine financial dispersion engineers. <laughs> They'd have their own magazine, Pirating Today. You know, to have ads in it for pantaloons that hang real low so your boxer shorts puff out the back. <laughs> Articles in it like, launder your loot on eBay. Is your crew spending too much time on MySpace? You know, things, things we all need to know to run an efficient pirating operation. We'd start to see little rich white high school kids sneaking, in with, sneaking into school with swords and peg legs trying to keep it real, matey. <laughs> Sure. 
And that's the show for today, friends. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, you can find the show notes and bonus goodies and all that kind of stuff for this episode at underthecrossbones.com slash 015. Uh, if you want to do some of that, click the Amazon banner, donate, sponsor, all that kind of stuff, underthecrossbones.com slash support. If you want to find out more about Ye Banished Privateers, you can find them at yebanishedprivateers.com. If you want to hear about more about my comedy and find out where I'm going to be and all that kind of stuff, you can find me at philjohnsoncomedy.com. Make sure you subscribe to the show so you get the new episodes downloaded automatically every Tuesday morning. And uh, keep leaving the iTunes reviews. Keep telling your friends. I can't tell you how important and helpful that is to the show uh, that you do that. So thank you very much, and I will see you next Tuesday.